All right, today is July 29th. It's about 10 minutes after 12, and we're sitting right outside of Creel Springs with Ed Russell at Bellaterra Wineries. How are you doing, Ed? Doing great. Great, great. Um, Ed, you know, you've walked us around the winery so far, and it's really been exciting. Uh, a lot of fun to see everything. And um, now's our opportunity to kind of sit down and kind of talk a little bit about, you know, who you are, why you do what you do, and kind of what sorts of things you do. So, you know, First off, we'll start with something real easy for you. Can you just give us your age and date of birth? Kind of introduce yourself. Age is 64. Date of birth is 92243. Okay. And your name is Ed Russell? Ed, Edward Russell. Mm -hmm. Now, I've lo I looked over your, your biography, and, or your biographical form, and I saw that you did construction mm -hmm. for quite a while. Um, did you do construction around here? Or? Yes, I was an iron worker by trade. Oh, really? An okay. iron worker. Mm -hmm. So, how does an iron worker, somebody who's working with iron, come about to start a winery? That's yeah, quite a transition, isn't it? Yeah. How it came about was I more or less retired from construction and wanted to raise uh, table grapes. A few. And uh, I enrolled in classes at Shawnee College to learn how to grow grapes. And while at the college, I uh, became acquainted with 20 or 30 other students that were there to learn how to grow wine grapes. So what they told me was when you grow table grapes, to try to find a place to sell them is very difficult because some of the the main supermarkets are already have contracts with big growers, so I wouldn't be growing that much. So my only outlet would be a farmer's market. Well, at a farmer's market, you would take a pickup load and sell that weekend, and then try to take another pickup load the next weekend. Well, by then, they're overripe. So they said if you grow wine grapes, then you're able to harvest all at one time and take them all to a winery and, and that's quicker and more efficient and easier to do. So that's when I converted from table grapes into wine grapes. Well, as I got into the wine grape growing, I, became, I began to network with wineries and working with them and learning what they were doing and why they were doing it and how they were doing it. Uh, and that uh, was kind of a stepping stone into the winery business. And uh, after going through the year's training on growing grapes, they had, uh, Shawnee College had a beginner's class, an intermediate, and an advanced class. The first part was how to prepare the site work for a vineyard. And the second part was the pruning and the maintenance of the vines. And then the third part was the spraying, the fungicide, herbicide, pesticides, the chemical end of it. So after I completed that course, then I planted uh, the vines uh, and uh, networked with other wineries in order to sell them the fruit that I was growing. And uh, then Shawnee College had another course on the, uh, the introduction to winemaking. So I took that course. And then Alan Dillard, uh, who is a uh, wine uh, maker, had a five-week course on the fundamentals of making wine. And I took that with him. Uh, so I, I, I became acquainted with the wine making and I, and I became familiar with the fundamentals of wine making. But then I have also a couple of consultants that are winemakers that helped and assist me, uh, that uh, helped me run the tests and do the taste tests and recommend the blendings and uh, in other words to people that know what they're doing to keep me from making a twenty thousand dollar mistake on a tank of wine so that's a good investment anytime you can get a consultant that knows more than you do about anything it's cheaper to hire him than it is to adventure on your own because sometimes you get into some of this wine and you do some things with it and you can't back it up and start again you either have to go forward or you dump it yeah, I can't. Uh, so it's too risky and it's too expensive. So I've got a couple people that I call on that comes and helps me and assists me. 
until I become more familiar with it and become more knowledgeable. And, and uh, wine making is a science. Everybody uh, makes wines different. They have different uh, techniques. They have different uh, things that they're trying to do with their wine to reach the consumers that they're selling to. Some people like dry wines, red. Some people like dry whites, and some prefer the Concords or the blends or various styles. Each winemaker's got a little bit different style, a little bit different presentation, uh, and uh, it's quite extensive. That's why I, I don't recommend it for anybody just to think that they're going to press grapes, get the juice, put it in a tank, and turn on the valve and start bottling, because there's a lot more to it than that. But that's how I transitioned from iron worker into winery, was, was looking for an outside hobby, growing table grapes. And it developed into wine grapes, it developed into winery, and that's, and that's where I am today. Now, I, I, I also saw that you're married. Is your wife involved in all this? The wife works here. Uh, she's the one that's more or less in charge of the kitchen and the bookkeeping. Uh, and I uh, am basically in charge of the vineyard and the winemaking. And then I work up here in the marketing and the wholesale end of it. But she's very uh, instrumental in the, in the operation. Great, great. Now, I mean, it's it's a very interesting, you know, change that you that you've done with your with your life, going from iron working to this. I'm just kind of wondering, as a child, were you interested in, you know, some kind of vineyards or? Oh, I've always been interested. Or? Yes, I've always been interested in vineyards and orchards and. A lot of that, you know, as a kid I worked in a lot of those and, really? and uh, I, uh, it, it hasn't been a long term desire to get into it, but I'm comfortable being in it because I've been around it pretty much my whole life. This, this whole Southern Illinois area used, was mostly all apple orchards and peach orchards at one time because of the labor constraints and the different problems. It's, kind of reduced down to probably three or four main growers now, but it used to be you couldn't, you probably couldn't drive three or four miles. There wasn't a peach orchard or an apple orchard or a strawberry patch or something down here. Yeah. No, I mean, as you grew up and you were working in the, in the construction business and everything, was it always like a thought in the back of your mind, I want to get back into this? Well, I think, yeah, I think that's in the back of everybody's mind because we have a lot of people come in here from Chicago and they've been in Chicago working their life, a whole life, and, they, and then they retire and what do they do? They want to come to Southern Illinois, the quiet life, and then they come in, they sit down and they say, what would you recommend if I wanted to grow two acres of grapes or if I wanted to get in strawberries? So I think that's in the back of everybody's. Everybody's kind of a grower or wants to be a grower. Uh, they want the earth and they want to be around, uh, you know, the, the, the good times of life or the quiet times of life. You know, they remember Thanksgivings and they remember pumpkins and they remember. And I think that's entrained in people's lifestyle. Uh, I don't know of too many farmers around here that retired and went to Chicago. <laughs> it's most of them retired in Chicago and come to Southern Illinois. Or, and not necessarily Chicago, but uh, all over the country. There's people that live in Southern Illinois from all parts of the country that come here. Because uh, the, the winters are basically fairly nice here. There's some people that live in Florida that's moved back to Southern Illinois. Uh, so it's, it's got a nice climate. Once in a while we'll have some bad weather. but as a rule, on average, if you take a five or ten year average, you have nice winters. It's not too bad. Maybe two or three weeks of real bad weather, and then it's and everything else is bearable and doable. You know. Interesting. Well, great. Um, I'm kind of wondering now. I mean, you, you say you're in your first real year of growing grapes and, and making wine, mm -hmm. but can you tell us kind of when you really, really started? Well. Yeah. It's not the first year of growing grapes. This is the first full year that I've been open for a retail business. Uh, I started the grapes, the vineyard uh, was planted in 2000. I started selling grapes in 2004, 2005. 
but I've been open to here since uh, May of 207. Uh, actually, the basement was finished first, and that's when we started uh, with the wine in order to have wine to sell when the when the retail was finished. So uh, it's it's not just been a recent thing; it's been an ongoing thing for the last eight years. And then there's a lot to you don't just open a winery. There's a there's a lot of planning. There's lots of equipment. There's a lot of uh, lab equipment and chemicals and cleaning equipment and scheduling and labels do you have to buy and bottles and capsules and uh, it, it's not an overnight it, there's a lot of planning goes into a winery a lot of planning and uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, luck to a point because if you if you don't have good fruit on the vines you don't have quality fruit it's tough to make quality wine if you don't have something to work with. So you, the, everything starts in the vineyard. You have to have a good, sound, healthy vineyard, uh, good quality fruit, a good growing season, just enough moisture to uh, be ample enough for the plants to, to grow and not too dry, not too wet. If it's too wet, you get a lot of disease. So you have to have a lot of luck in the vineyard, along with doing the best you can with what you have in order to get disease-free fruit so that when you do process it and it goes into that tank, it's got good flavors and good smells and makes a nice wine. Uh, so everything starts in the vineyard and then ends up in the tank, and whether you have good wine, bad wine, mediocre wine, award-winning wine or acceptable wine or however you want to describe it. It all starts with good fruit to get sound wine, to, to keep it within the parameters of the different things. Uh, and it's uh, a lot more complicated than I thought it was going to be. You know, I'm not afraid of a challenge. Uh, because that's what life is. Life is nothing but daily challenges. And I thought this would be a, just a quick learn. And then I find out it's not a quick learn. It's a learning process. And it takes, uh, and, I don't, uh, and I, I don't know near what I need to know. Uh, but, it, but I'm learning. And I, and, and I have people that come in here, customers that come in that say that the wines that I have here are some of the best that they've drank. Uh, and that's quite a compliment. And then a lot of them back it up by buying cases, which is good, but it's even better because they buy mixed cases. If you buy a mixed case, that means you like all of them. If you just buy a case of one kind, then that's one style that you like. But I've had several come in here and give me two bottles of each one. So that's good. That's good. And that's what I want. I'd rather sell two bottles of each one and and know that they're all good quality, good sound, good tasting, flavorful, uh, uh, and people enjoy, rather than just specializing in one style of wine. You know, you mentioned a little bit earlier that a lot of planning goes into making a wine. Mm -hmm. A lot of planning goes into the vineyard. Can you take us back to that, kind of that early planning stage when you're sitting down with your life and saying, I think I want to do this. Can you kind of tell, describe it? Well, you don't want to go back that far. <laughs> there was some discussion in there. And I, I don't want to cover that ground again. Uh, but I would recommend anybody that wants to get into a winery or get into a vineyard or any kind of agriculture or whatever they want to get into, they need to find out where they can get the training. If there's no training available, they need to find out in their area who's in that type of business, and then they need to apprentice with them. And they need to do that for a few months or a year so that they fully understand what they're getting involved with and what the investment's going to be and where they're going, what they're going to do with their product when it becomes mature. You, there's no sense to raise a product if you don't have a place to sell it. 
Uh, and there's no sense in taking the, the ground that you have and investing thousands of dollars in it on the chance that it's going to turn out. You need to know what you're doing to protect your investment. And that's why I would recommend networking. That's just like myself. I went to school to learn how to grow. I went to classes to learn how to make wine. But I didn't stop there. I started networking with the other wineries. I became acquainted with the vintners and the winemakers. I, I uh, witnessed the problems they were having. I assessed their strengths and their weaknesses. What, what's their winery got that everybody likes? Or what's this winery got that everybody dislikes? And then you, you take an assessment of all the ones that you visit. You know, you go to one place and they sell pizzas delicious pizzas, but they've only got three tables in the whole building. Well, three tables, you, you got eight people and 20 people standing. So obviously they needed a bigger area or make a less attractive pizza, one or the other. But those are the things that I looked at. I, you know, uh, strengths and weaknesses of the other wineries and the other people that are the parking lots, you know, a nice building but no parking lot. A big parking lot with small building, uh, no shade trees, uh, no retail bar. People come in, they want to buy a bottle of wine and leave, and the, and the tasting bar is full, 4D. Well, they're not going to stand in line and wait for you to talk for 30 minutes to somebody to buy a bottle. So I put a retail bar in so they can sidetrack the tasting bar and, and uh, uh, make it... Uh, most everybody that uh, visits us got children, so you want to be have a children's atmosphere or a family atmosphere. Uh, that's why we have the bocce court, uh, we have the horseshoes, we have the bean bags, we have the washers, uh, something to entertain the children while the adults are at the tasting bar or, or doing what other activity. Uh, the picnic tables, people like to picnic, they like to bring their own food. So these are all the things that I kind of saw in visiting, uh, and I brought that all to bear here. Uh, with, uh, and I've still got a ways to go. I've still got some things I need to do. I need to do some night events, and I need to put some lighting up. I've tried to get the county. When I built the building, the county promised me they were going to do the road. Uh, and I've been open 18 months now on the road. I, see, I did see the road grader go by the other day. He was about 35 miles an hour and his blade was a foot off the ground, so I don't think he did much blading. Uh, so I, I've almost gave up on that end of it. Um, but if I had the road in, that would be a big improvement to this. To this because we get, uh, we get buses, we get limousines, we get motorcycles, we get antique cars, we get convertibles, uh, and we get people from all walks of life. Uh, people in here that own a string of Hilton hotels, people that own a string of restaurants uh, or a series. Uh, you never know who's coming in that door because tourists come through here, people traveling. Uh, I had two girls coming through the other day going to Chicago. They'd come from Puerto Rico and they were headed to Chicago. They came in. They saw the sign on the highway. You never know who's coming through that door. Uh, but you try to make the best presentation that you can, try to put the best face, you know. They may not make a stop in Illinois other than here. So if, it, if you can leave a good impression with them, be a good host, show them some hospitality. Uh, they leave here with a nice memory. They take pictures. I've had groups come in and they want me to take their picture as a group. So it's, it's a nice, and I keep a scrapbook of all the different people that come in. Uh, and it, uh, people leave here, they're pretty, pretty happy, pretty content, and, and most of them are glad they stopped. Uh, and that's, that's really what it's all about. When you're in the wine business, you try to make good wine, that's number one. But then again, you've got to be a good host. You've got to be able to communicate with people, talk to them, uh, make them feel at ease. Because when they walk through the door, this is their first time here. And when you walk into a new establishment for the first time, you don't know if they're going to be friendly, if they're going to be grouches. You don't know what to expect, so you kind of got your guard up. But if you break the ice and tell them good afternoon and how you doing and glad you showed up, and, uh, then it kind of it settles them down, and then they become open. And then they tell you a little bit about their history and their life, and 
uh, where they came from and where they're going and and it makes it interesting. And that's really the fun part of it. If there's a if there's a fun part of being in the winery business, that's the fun part. That's the fun part. Everything else is the work part. Yeah. And I kind of like to talk a little bit about some of the work part. But first, can you kind of explain to us? I mean, you have a very beautiful place here. The, the vineyards and the winery, everything is just gorgeous. Can you kind of give us a description of what it would look like to somebody who came here? Well, it would be a, a customer friendly uh, place. Be a, it's got a certain amount of ambience and a certain comfort zone. Uh, it's uh, got some nice scenery. Uh, it's got a lot of wild that come and go. Uh, it's a very family oriented type business, so if you have children, you can bring them. Uh, it's uh, kind of a retreat. It's kind of isolated. It's it's not. Uh, I think the nearest house from here is three fourths of a mile, so you you're kind of out in the in the wilderness. Uh, uh, excuse me. I thought I gave them to you, Don. There you go. Thank you. It's <laughs> uh, the hazard of being in charge, right? Pardon? It's the hazard of being in charge. That's the hazard of being the only one with the keys. <laughs> oh, there you go. That's it. <laughs> but inventory controls better when I have the key. <laughs> well, great. Well, can you tell us how much, um, how much land do you have in the vineyards? I've got approximately 15 acres in vineyards. And about 15 acres in buildings and ponds and and uh, kind of a park area, I'd say. Uh, so there's approximately 30 acres on this side, and then I've got about 150 or so acres, 45 acres across the road. Uh, and are you planning on turning that into vineyards too? It's a possibility, but it'll be a, probably a couple of years from now. At some point in time, when those vines are about 10 years old, I'll probably start planting like two acres a year uh, until I get a, a replacement in, uh, rather than planting them all at one time or trying to do it. It's better to start off with a couple of acres because it's easier to control and easier to keep up with. Then the next year maybe two more acres and then two more. Uh, maybe add another variety. Uh, I wish that I uh, would have planted more concords or some it seems like the tastes in this part of the country and the tour, even tourists that come from Chicago, it doesn't make any difference where they're from. But they like the sweeter wines uh, more so than the dry. The dry wines have their place, but that group is uh, probably two out of 20 that like dry wines. The other 18 like sweeter wines. And, uh, and then there's a few that really like the sweet, sweet wines. Uh, so I, if I had, uh, if I was going to plant, I'd probably plant some, some of that type of variety of, of vines. Some more Concord, some more Niagara, uh, Vidal, uh, makes make some nice, sweet, semi-sweet wines. If we were to look at kind of the the life of a grape, I guess the grape life cycle here. Can you kind of explain to us what that cycle is, you know, from the time the grape starts growing to when it ends up in the bottle? What goes on in between? Well, probably let's start off in the winter when the plant's dormant. In the winter, uh, the plant becomes dormant, loses its leaves, but it still has the fruiting shoots from the previous harvest. So then you uh, go in there and uh, cut these fruiting shoots off and leave so many buds on each fruiting shoot and that'll be your fruiting shoots for next year. And then you clean up all your cuttings. Then in the spring, uh, about the middle of April, the buds on these fruiting shoots start to swell and then they'll break out and then they'll start getting little leaf structures on them. And that's 
middle of April to the first of May. And then, then your new fruiting shoots start to come out. And then they'll uh, flower, and then the grapes will form into the little clusters, and then they'll begin to grow. Uh, and in the meantime, you're spraying fungicide sprays and for black rot and various diseases. Uh, then as you get up into June, uh, you start cleaning the middles out. If you have a GDC system or a two-wire system, you start cleaning the middles out. You start doing some shoot thinning. Uh, you, you, it's, ideally, you like to keep your shoots about a hand's width. Uh, you'll start that. Uh, and then uh, cut the suckers off of the trunks. Keep the trunks clean. Put your herbicide underneath the plant. Keep the grass down so the humidities and so forth doesn't form under there. And the grass sometimes saps the energy or the nutrients out of the ground. You know, the plant doesn't get it. Uh, and then, then you're going into the summer months, uh, July and August, and you've got to keep your spray program going. And then you try to go back and cluster thin. If you've got too many clusters on a fruiting shoot, ideally, on a fruiting shoot, if you had an ideal plant and you had three clusters of grapes on that one shoot, ideally, according to the, what I've read, is there needs to be 13 leaves for each cluster. So if you have three clusters on that fruiting shoot, you should have 39 leaves minimum. Now that's ideal. And I don't know if very many that's got ideal vineyards, but that's the ideal. Uh, and then you come, uh, you know, probably two or three, two weeks before harvest, three weeks before harvest, you will go out into the vineyard and you will randomly pick berries off the clusters. You walk down through there and you'll take one or two berries off that cluster and then a little further down, one or two berries off that cluster. And you try to, to get uh, some kind of an idea of what that section is doing. And you'll collect 100 to 200 berries from various parts of that section. And then you'll take and uh, mash those berries up into juice. And then you'll run your sugar test to see where the brick and where the different parameters are, your acidity or your pH. And that gives you an indication of about how long it is before harvest. And then you, you'll probably do it again a week before harvest to See where, see where you're at with your sugar. As a rule, the, the brick or the sugar, they like 22 to 24 brick, ideally. Uh, low acid, low pH. Uh, and a lot of those factors depend on how you maintain the vineyard. If you overcrop it and, and you do various things that uh, you don't give it the attention that it needs, you end up with a higher pH and higher acids and the, uh, the brick, if you've got too many, too many clusters on there, the sugar may not come up. Then you have to capitalize it to bring the sugar up. If the pH is too high, uh, the wine becomes unstable. Uh, you may end up with vinegar. There's a lot of, that's why I said a few minutes ago, everything starts in that vineyard. That vineyard is, the, that's, that's the foundation of a winery. Everything in that vineyard has to be on target for that wine to be drinkable. Uh, and, uh, and, then, and then after you harvest and you process your juice and uh, you ferment and you turn it into wines, uh, then you go back and do a post spray. Uh, to, uh, you, you, just because you took the fruit off, you can't neglect the vine. Because if it picks up a disease going into the fall, it's going to carry that disease right on into the next spring. So you have to do post-harvest sprays, uh, as well as uh, the sprays in the spring. So I'll average 18 to 20 sprays a year, and it runs me from, depending on the spray I'm using, six to $800 every time I spray, uh, and, uh, plus the herbicide, the grass killer, and plus the expense of the mowing. And, maintenance and trellis repair and various things but it uh, 
If you're looking for a busy job, this would be a good one because there's always something to do. I told somebody the other day, if you've run out of anything to do, you've just lost your list, you better go look for your list because there's plenty to do all the time. Um, you know, you've mentioned a few times that you, you have um, spray for different things like black rock, and then you've also mentioned some insects as well. Can mm -hmm. you kind of tell us what some of the larger ones are? I, I guess black rock's one of them. Well, you, uh, you have to, for Brotritis, which is a noble rot or a, a rot, uh, uh, I don't know, there's a, there's a host of, of problems that you can have, but I've never had any of the problems to really research it because I, I prevent them before they happen. That's the thing about the spray program. When you do start having, uh, you, you start having what they call leaf spot and, and various types of problems. You don't spray to correct them. You spray to prevent them. So if you do a, a spray schedule on a regular basis, then really you don't have anything to worry about. And I've never had any disease problems, so I haven't researched different diseases. If I'd have had a, a, a disease problem, I'd research it and find out what it is. But I've always worked on a preventive, so I, in the eight years I've never had any disease but I, I spray to prevent it. I don't wait till I get the disease and then try to how, figure out how to eradicate it yeah. because it's too late then. Yeah. You're already in trouble. Uh, but there's probably six or eight standard type. Uh, phylloxera might be one of them, but uh, you spray, that's a pesticide, you spray for that. Uh, there's several, but really I haven't got into the different ones because I've never had that problem. So I really don't know. Now you said you're in a spray program. What exactly, I mean, how does the program work? Well, a program is when you, uh, you spray every two weeks or so. Okay. And you may use, uh, for instance, on the spray this week, you may use a bound. Uh, and a bound is a fungicide that's got the uh, chemicals in it to combat most of the problems that you would have. And then the next week, you might use uh, pristine, which is another fungicide. Uh, in the beginning of the year, you would use like Pinkazep, uh, which is good for one type of disease, like bunch rot, black rot. And then you might uh, assist it with uh, uh, a Nova or, a, or another type of uh, chemical. And uh, you use seven. You might use Danitol, which is a, another pesticide. But you try to come up with, uh, like the Vignole, that's a tight, real tight cluster. And you want to spray that with a chemical, I use Elevate, before the berries swell up and go tight. Because once the berries get tight, the, the spray won't penetrate. And that's, that's part of that particular grape, the Vignole. Uh, so you'd use that. Uh, you have to be careful with the concords because you, you cannot use the pristine on the concords because they'll uh, defold. Uh, uh, that particular grape uh, doesn't do well with pristine, so you have to work around the sprays on that. And, uh, and that's part of the program. And not using the same sprays over and over and over again because if you use the same sprays, then the plants become immune to it. And then when you spray, you're, you're just wasting your time because it's not doing any good. It's like some insects, you spray them with the same thing over and over again, they become, they adjust to that chemical. Uh, and that's why on these, I spray with seven, but then I, I come back with another chemical called Danitol, which is a little bit more stringent, a little stronger. Uh, and that kind of changes it up a little bit, it keeps it different. But you, you keep track of, uh, of course you have to, if you're, now I went to school again, or went and took classes so that I could become a licensed applicator, which some chemicals you have to be a licensed applicator before they'll sell them to you. Uh, but you keep a record of uh, the spray you use, uh, which plants you put what spray on, 
what kind of a day it was, was it a, a sun shining, what was the temperature, what direction the, and how strong was the wind blowing. Uh, and you keep this in, a, in your records uh, uh, basically so that if you forget what you did, you can, re, you can go back. So it's just a good bookkeeping thing. And then if you were using something that would do damage to your neighbor's crop or harm uh, some plants somewhere else, at least you've got a record to show what you used and that, that what you used either caused it or didn't cause it, but at least you've got a record of it. Uh, but it's really just a reference so that you don't use the same sprays over and over. Uh, um, now, you, when we were in the video, you kind of explained that there's certain land features that you want to put vineyards on, you know, you were talking about how they're on hills and other things. Can you tell us why? Well, you want you want to put a vineyard on the highest elevation you can get. The highest elevation with enough drop so that you, you don't get the frost. The cold air has a way to escape from the hilltop of the vineyard, uh, which the frosts are important in the spring. They can, uh, they can do damage to your crop. So you want to be up on a hill. And you want to be up on a hill for the drainage, not only for the subsoil drainage, which you take care of when you subsoil, but the surface drainage, so that the plant is not standing in a sump of water. Um, and then uh, you want to be on top of the hill because of the airflow. You want the air to be able to blow through those plants and keep those leaves dry, because uh, wet leaves on humid days is what is where your disease or certain temperature ranges in there when your disease is really are, are more evident and more capable than they are on other days uh, but you want it on the hillside for airflow and preferably on the sunny side of the hill uh, which is not always possible because it depends on how your ground lays but uh, it seems like the plants on the sunnier side of the hill uh, do better than the plants on the opposite side of the hill. Uh, but I would, uh, before I would plant any uh, any vines, I would get soil tests to find out if the soil is uh, where it needs to be for those for that particular fruit or whatever that you're planting. And uh, and I would definitely recommend subsoiling the ground fracturing the ground, breaking the ground up down to the hard pan to give those roots of plants to, uh, a chance to grow and expand. I think you have a healthier, you can see the vineyard out there, how healthy it is. And I think uh, that's attributed a lot to just that subsoil and tearing that ground up. You take an old hard, pound piece of, uh, hard pan ground and try to plant something and it just strangles itself. It just won't let it grow. But if you subsoil it, and fracture the ground up good, then those roots, those roots just thrive and, and grow, and the plant stays healthy. So uh, I would recommend that if someone was wanting to put a vineyard in, and I know a few of them around here that's planted a vineyard, and they bypass that uh, because of the expense. It's expensive to get a subsoiler and somebody that's got a tractor big enough to do it. But I think it's the foundation of a vineyard. It's it's. It's like a building. If you've got a good foundation, you can put a building up. Bad foundation, the building's going to fall in. Over a period of five or six, eight years, there'll be a price to pay if you don't really subsoil that ground and get it ready. Hmm. Um, you know, you've mentioned a, a bunch of times different people that are out there that have given you advice and that have helped you out. Can you talk a little bit about the different consultants that you've had and different advice and a lot of the networking that you've done? Uh, the names or the locations? Just, or just sorts of things that you've... Well, it's just like in the school, I had... Uh, we started off with Dave Ponce, who was an instructor. Uh, uh, Gary Orlandini was an instructor for uh, Alan Dillard. Uh, winemaker, instructor. Uh, uh, 
Denny Franklin, winemaker at uh, Pheasant Hollow. Uh, Karen Han, winemaker at Blue Sky. Uh, those people were probably the most knowledgeable in this area, and that's why the colleges selected them to be the instructors. Uh, and, uh, what sorts of advice have they given you? Are there any foundational pieces of advice that they, they, they gave you? Well, that's the nice thing about people. That each one's got a different piece of advice. <laughs> uh, advice as to, I, I'm not following your train of thought, advice as to get into the grape growing business yeah, or advice on how to grow grapes? How to grow both. Yeah. Well, they've given me that advice, both ends. Uh, on how to do it and the problems they'd had and how they overcame them and, uh, and the wine making end of it. Uh, this is a, you know, this is not a widget company. This is not where you set up your press or your machine and you kick out widgets. Mm -hmm. This is this is kind of a. Uh, kind of the difference between a chef and a cook. So if you're going to succeed in this type of business, you better be able to network with other people to find out what, what kind of problems they're having. And if you have the same problems, how to overcome those problems. Uh, and uh, how their businesses are doing. And, and uh, it, is, it is a, this is a, if there was ever a networking business, this would be the one. This would be a networking business. And, and talking to them and finding out the problems that they've had uh, with their vines or the problems they've had with their wineries or the problems they've had with their wines. Uh, and everybody kind of works together collectively uh, to, so that what we really want to do, I guess, basically is have a representation in Southern Illinois of having acceptable wines and good wines. And, uh, and try to uh, improve on the tourists and uh, make a living, uh, that type of thing. But, uh, yeah, and, and the thing of it is that when you call one of them, they're always ready to help you. They'll loan you something, they'll come help you. It's, they, they, very seldom is that I'll call you back later. It, they're, they're very nice people, very easy to work with. And, and it's helped me quite a bit on different things. Uh, well, that's good. It's always great to have help. Um, you know, I'm wondering if you can explain to us, you know, kind of the end result of all the, all the grapes that you're growing out there, and that's the wine. Can you kind of explain to us the wines that you do make? Well, you've got six varieties of grapes, uh, which I told earlier, you know, you got the Saval, the Traminette, the Vidal, Vigneault, and Concord. Uh, you take those six varieties that I have, and then you make dry wines and semi-sweet wines and sweet wines, and then you blend them in various ways. And what you try to do is to come up with a selection that appeals to different people. Some people only like red blushes. Some people only like white wines. Some people only like dry wines. Some people like semi-dry. Some people only drink sweet wines. So you take those six that you've got and you try to do things with them. You try to blend them and change them and do things with them that appeals to most everybody. But you're not gonna have one wine that's gonna to appeal to everybody. But if you can make 10 or 15 selections that appeal to somebody, uh, then that, that's really what you're trying to do with them. Uh, and then, of course, the names of the wines, or what you want to call them, is, is your discretion. You can call them. Uh, there's Cash River Winery down the road that's got water moccasin, and, I don't know what all, snake bite or something, but, but that's, that's, his, that's his attraction. You have tourists come in here and they see these names of these wines and they take them home for souvenirs. Uh, but you can call a wine 
whatever name that the federal government will approve your label for. But basically all you're doing is just blending your wines up to try to make them palatable to various... Uh, you have a husband and wife come in and you think they live together, they're married, and, and you think they'd agree on something. But he wants the white wine, she wants the red wine, you know. I mean, so you have to make wines to suit everybody. Uh, and that's a challenge. That's sure a challenge. So how do you decide what mixes and everything else? What's the process of doing Well, you, you decide on a lot of different things. You decide on the quality of the fruit you've got. If you have a high acid wine and a low acid wine, you blend them together, get the middle of the road. Uh, blend a percentage of one wine with another wine, you get a different flavor. Uh, there's just a whole varied ways to, that you can come together. But you have to bear in mind that what you come up with and what you put together, you want to try to stay consistent. Because if you're making a style of wine that a certain person likes, when they come back next year, they want that same style. They don't want to find out it's been discontinued and going to another style. So you got the consistency and trying to stay, and that's another where you have a lot of records and a lot of bookkeeping. And you know, if, if you were like a winery in California and you specialized in Merlot or Pinot Noir or Zinfandel, and that was your specialty, and then that's what you grew and that's what you vintered, and that's what you bottled, and that's what you wholesaled, life would be simple. <laughs> but when you try to make 10 or 15 different styles, it becomes a little more complicated. Uh, but it would be so simple. If I only had one style of grape, I only made one style of wine, and I only sold it to one distributor, I could take six months of the year off, I think. <laughs> Now, I mean, you're, you're tasting the different, different fruits for which one makes more, a more acidic wine, which one makes a less acidic wine. How are you doing that? Are you tasting it, physically tasting it, or are you testing it chemically? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. You, you only test it chemically to see if it's sound, and see if it's uh, got enough of uh, various preservative chemicals like SO2 or sulfites or whatever. But uh, the end result is the taste test. That's the end result. That's, that's the one that tells you whether you're going to bottle it or not. If it doesn't taste good, doesn't smell good, doesn't look good, you're not going to bottle 5,000 bottles. You're not going to bottle 5,000 bottles of something that's just going to sit down there and be a storage item. Now, no, I have various peoples. The ones I explained a minute ago, like Orlandini and and uh, Denny Franklin and, uh, and I think Alan Dillard a couple times. But we do tastes and recommendations and ideas. And, you know, th there may be something that you can do with it that you hadn't even thought of that one of them would think of. You know, but, uh, uh, so now I'm sure you get this question a lot. Which is your favorite wine? All of them. All of them? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like them all. Really? I really do. Uh, if I had one that I would sit down and have a steady diet of it, I probably would single one out. But there's not a one that I make that I don't like. I like all of them. How about, how about your wife? Pardon? How about your wife? Which one does she like? Yes. Oh, I'm not real sure, but she likes all of them too. She might favor one over the other, but, I, but I've never... I think whenever I watch her drink wine, she's always getting it from a different bottle. And I don't know whether she's drinking it because that's what she likes or she's checking it to make sure they're still, still good. Yeah. Uh, but I like all of them. I like, I like the blushes and I like the whites. I like the vigno. Uh, uh, I like a glass of the sweet wines. I don't like a whole lot of the sweet wines, but I like a glass of the, especially the full-bodied red sweet that goes real good with barbecue or spicy foods. It's, it seems like it's, it's got a real nice flavor to it. Uh, I've got a light blush that I like. 
that's fruity and flavorful. That's good. I, I've got that uh, Vigneault uh, that makes a very nice wine. I, I, really, I like them all. I, I, there's none that I don't like. Uh, you know, there's a real, uh, there's a culture about tasting wine. And, you know, can you kind of talk a little bit about that? Well, it, it, uh, I probably don't know a whole lot about that other than the average person. But uh, when, you, when you take the cork out, you're supposed to smell the cork. If it smells like vinegar, then the wine is no good, okay? Then you pour the wine into the glass about half full, and then you swirl it, which is open up the aromas and the flavors and give it that bouquet. And then you smell or nose to see if it smells okay. Uh, and you see some of them, they'll turn the glass sideways to see it, if it's got the legs or on the side of the glass and uh, then they'll taste it and they'll try to figure out just what type of flavors is in there you know cherries or uh, cream or uh, almonds or chocolate or what flavors they're picking up uh, and, but everybody tastes different one person will pick up this and the other person won't uh, so really what it boils down to, you can do all these things that you want, the nose and swirling and cork test, and you can do it all. But really it all boils down to, do you enjoy the flavors? Do you enjoy what you're drinking? I had a person come in here one day and said, I want to buy a case of, of this. After they went through all the tastings, they wanted to buy a case uh, to give away. And uh, they priced it, and, and I was about two dollars too high. I said, "They said, well, I can buy wine for so many dollars. And yours is about two dollars too high." I said, "Well, did you taste? You tasted these today?" I said, yeah, I tasted them. They taste good. Okay. Now, would you rather pay two dollars more for a bottle of wine that tastes good, or go to the liquor store and buy it for two dollars less, and then when you give it away? They're going to drink a glass of it and pour it out because it doesn't taste good. So they said, well, that makes sense. I'll buy something I know they're going to drink rather than take a chance at the liquor store and something they're going to throw out. Uh, so but that's just part of it. That's why you have the tasting bar. That's why people come in and, and taste. You don't do that at the liquor store. You go to the liquor store, you look at the fancy bottle and the fancy label and the fancy capsule and... Uh, and you, you know, you think, boy, that, that should be great wine. Got a $40 price tag on it. That's going to be great. And then when you get it home and take the capsule off and open it up and you pour it out and it takes your breath away. You say, where in the world did that come from? So uh, it's, it's always nice to go visit a winery where you can taste what you're actually buying. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a lot of work to be done here. There's a whole lot of work to be done here. And I'm wondering, you know, how many employees do you have? Well, it varies uh, between part-time, full-time, and harvest time, pruning time, cellar time. You'll average anywhere from 5 to 15. Uh, just like bottling, you need 5 or 6 for bottling, 3 or 4 in the vineyard, 2 or 3 in the bar. Uh, tomorrow, uh, We'll only, we won't be bottling tomorrow, so we'll only need two or three in the vineyard. And a couple up here. Uh, the weekends, you may need four or five up here. Nobody in the vineyard, nobody in the cellar. Harvest time, you'll need 12 or 15 pickers, and then you'll need three or four people running the crush line and the, and the bottling line, and two or three people bringing the fruit in from the vineyard. It, it's no, There's no constant. It's, it's always a variable depending on what you're doing for that particular day. It's kind of seasonal, I guess. Well, it's seasonal and it depends on how the workload falls in place. Just like uh, the bottling. We'll try to bottle a couple, a couple of times a week for the next four or five weeks. And then the bottling's over with, probably till January. Uh, so that phase of it is behind you. And then we'll get into the harvesting phase. So it varies. 
Oh. Well, how do you get these employees that are part time that come in for just picking this site? Well, you just run an ad in the paper and interview. And, uh, they um, fill out an application and try to find out what skills they have and if they've ever worked with the vineyards or vines before and if they can run equipment or get a feel for what they can do and then you just put them uh, on your list and if you need someone you uh, go back to that list and, and give them a call uh, and then word of mouth people that work here tell somebody and then they come in and, uh, um, what kinds of special equipment do you need to well, you, uh, to grow grapes, yeah. well, you need a tractor, a vineyard tractor. Uh, it needs to be uh, small so it can get up and down the rows. It needs to be ideally a four-wheel drive. Uh, and then you need a, uh, a sprayer. And uh, the sprayer, according to the size vineyard you have, and according to the size tractor you got. I had a fellow tell me the other day, he bought him a sprayer, and I said, well, that's good. Uh, what horsepower tractor goes with that sprayer? Well, he said, I don't know. <laughs> I said, well, you need to check, because you have to match the horsepower of the tractor to the sprayer. Uh, but you need a four-wheel drive at any rate, uh, because when, you, when you're spraying, you need to spray when you need to spray. Four-wheel drive tractor gets you through a vineyard in all types of wet conditions. Two-wheel drive and sometimes you have spin outs, tears up the sod. But you need a tractor, preferably a small tractor for a vineyard and you'll need a sprayer of some kind. Whether it be a pull behind sprayer or whether it be a tractor mounted sprayer, but you have to have some kind of a forced air sprayer. Uh, backpacks, Tank spraying doesn't work that well when you're spraying fungicide. You need an airflow type sprayer that blows them leaves around and gets that chemical all through the plant. And then you'll need a uh, mower system where you can mow the rows. Uh, you'll need hand pruners. If you're, uh, you'll need picking lugs. You'll need uh, the small 30-pound uh, lugs to pick up and down the rows, and then the thousand pound bins to pour them into. And then you'll need a loader of some sort to load your fruit up on a trailer, either to haul it to your winery or haul it to another winery. Uh, you'll need a, a, a system to uh, kill the grass, to spray your herbicide. Uh, I've got one called an environment system that I put uh, two and a half gallons of Roundup in on a 21 gallon tank and I can do two thirds of the vineyard with it. Uh, that, that's pretty basic on, on equipment uh, and, it, and the type of equipment. And you can buy used equipment or buy new equipment. Uh, it just depends on what you want to invest in your vineyard and, and how big your vineyard is. This, now I've got a 300 gallon spray tank uh, and I know some people that's got 50 or 75 gallon ones and if you got a, but the only thing is you have to reload all the time if you got a bigger tank you can you can do a couple three acres at one time before you have to reload uh, but the investment depends on whether you buy new used and how big your vineyard is and, uh, so you can get in with a small expense or you can get in with a large expense it just depends um, you know, let's talk a little bit about the marketing side of this, because I mean that's really what's keeping the fuel on the fire and keeping it going. Mm -hmm. um, you know, can you kind of explain how you, what you've done so far with marketing? Very little, other than advertise, uh, uh, newspaper, or television. You get some free press, some free interviews, uh, but most of it is uh, through the newspaper. And, and then that's your initial start. And then after that, it's word of mouth. Uh, as far as uh, marketing, the only thing that I've marketed is, is retail here. I have not done marketing extensively with the wholesale end of it. 
that's something I will get into, and it'll probably be a uh, contact uh, where I'll make uh, calls on various places and take samples and do that type of thing. Uh, the interstate signage is, is a good marketing tool. The state highway signs are a good marketing tool. Word of mouth is a good tool. Uh, and I'm still learning. I'm still learning. There's a lot to marketing. That's a trade in itself. Uh, so uh, I've got to cover some new ground on that later. You know, can we go and take this a step back from marketing and talk a little bit about the harvesting and processing of the grapes? You know, what mm -hmm. is it uh, when, when the guys go out in the field during the harvest time? What is it that they're doing? What are they looking for? All of that. Well, when they go out in the field at harvest time, they're only looking for one thing, and that's the grapes. They're not looking for anything else because that's already been looked for the day before or before you started. So you already know if you're disease-free or if you've got disease or if the fruit's clean or if it's ripe or if it's, the brick is up, the, if the pH is right or the acidity is right. That's all been took care of. When you go into that field to pick, you're, you've only got one mission. That's to pick. That's all you're after. Uh, but you pick the fruit and load it in the bins and then we bring it down to the basement where we have a grading table set up and they dump the fruit into the grading table and take out the leaves and the sticks and any foreign debris that may have got into that bin you take it out and grade it out so that it doesn't get into your crusher and it goes through the crusher and it destems it and, and, uh, and uh, separates the berries from the stems and then you pump it into your press. And the press is the, uh, the vinyl uh, uh, drum system that uh, forces, forces the uh, pressure against the fruit to, so that uh, the juice goes into the bottom of the catch pan. And then you pump that into your tank. And, then, and that's when it starts your fermentation. Not that particular day, but the next day you start your fermentation. Uh, but that's one of the reasons that I think the wines are above average is because when we start picking and when they're in them bins until, until it gets into that tank, it's not been over probably an hour and a half to two hours. Uh, whereas if you were buying your fruit from a distant vineyard, they usually pick all morning and then, and then uh, that afternoon they load the fruit on their trucks and then they take it to the winery and then the winery takes it off that truck puts it in a cooler and it sits in a cooler for a day or two and then they get the then they start pressing and crushing so there might be anywhere from one to three or four days during that process uh, that the fruit is degenerating and, and not as fresh and flavorful as it would be straight from the vineyard right into that pro into the tank and I think that is one of the one of the reasons our wines are, are so well accepted is because they're, they're fruity and got good flavors got a good nose uh, and uh, very very sound a very good balance very good finish uh, and we've had We've had uh, we've sold quite a bit and, and had some happy customers and and, uh, and I've had customers in here. Uh, I had one in here the other day that said she tasted the wines and she said she'd been to every winery in the country and she said she didn't find any. She's never found a wine as good as the wines we've got. She says you're way underpriced. You need to double your prices on all your wines because these are better than any I've tasted. Which. Normally you wouldn't pay attention to that, but she'd only had one glass of wine, so I knew she still had her facilities. Uh, so anyway, that was a compliment for me. You know, that's a compliment when they tell you things like that. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, now, one question I have about the, the heart process. So when the grapes are ripe, they're all ripe, 100%? Or are there some that are unripened? Are you talking about one variety? Or yeah, are you talking yeah, about one berry one on a cluster? One variety. As a rule, that was, let's go back to what we were talking about a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. When you go through the vineyard, 
and, and, you're, and you think things are about where they need to be for harvest. That's why you go through and you pick berries off randomly all over that vineyard. Then you put them in a package and then you mesh that package up and get the juice and then you run the tests on it. And that's the reason you randomly do that. You don't go to the first two plants and get your sample because you're not representing that whole section. You've got to go through there all over that section. And then when you bring it in, you crush it and impress it, you're doing it as a total package and not just off of a few berries. You, when you go in there and get those randomly, you don't just pick the ripe ones or just pick the green ones. You try to get an overall selection so that you've got an average of what you're going to have when it goes into that time. Now, um, of the different varieties, will different varieties ripen sooner than others? Or? There's some varieties, like the Concord and the Saval, somewhere around the middle of August, they'll, they'll be ready. And probably a week or so later, the Vignoles will be ready. Uh, the Chambersins and the Vidals are, are one of the later ones. Uh, they don't all ripen, thank goodness. They don't all come ripe at the same time. There is a little bit of a window in between each one of the varieties. Now, when they, when they ripen, depends on the weather and the climate, and different things. They may ripen. If you had a late, cold spring, they may be a week or two behind. It may be a week or two ahead on the other end. Well, they don't all ripen at the very same day of the year, uh, but they do ripen at varied times. Uh, now, is there something that you're looking for in like the ideal grape? What are the, you know, what are the standards in the ideal grape for your your wine? The ideal would be a uh, small berry full of flavors, with a nice sugar, with a low pH, and a, a moderate acid, uh, so, so that everything comes in uh, ideally. And that way you don't have to make adjustments. If the sugar comes in too low, you got to make adjustments to bring the sugar up in order to, for the yeast to convert to alcohol. The pH is too high. You have to make adjustments to bring that pH down. If the acidity is too high, you've got to make adjustments to bring it down. If the acidity is too low, you've got to make adjustments to bring it up. So ideally, it would be nice if they would all come in in balance, but that's, uh, that's not uh, likely unless you've got a perfect ideal vineyard with a perfect ideal growing season and uh, plenty of experienced help that, that uh, shoot thinned and leaf thinned and did everything, uh, you know, perfect. Uh, and, and you're not going to get perfect. I figure that if I can get 80 percent out of that vineyard, I, I'm probably fortunate to get 80 percent. Never get 100 percent. I don't think anybody would get 100 percent. You know, you put your you put your vineyard in in around 2000, correct? And it was quite a amount of time before you started seeing any return in terms of food or anything else. I mean, financially, financial-wise, how are you? How do you deal with this? You know, that, that's a lot of that's a lot of time. There's a lot of time in between there. Mm -hmm. How do you? I mean, how do you just handle that mentally? It's kind of. <laughs> you know. Well, you have to set a goal for yourself, mm -hmm. and of course, you sit down with a pencil and paper and you figure out what your expenses are. And you figure out how long you're going to have to endure that and what you're going to do with your fruit when it gets mature and what you think you're going to get out of it. And it's a gamble. It's a gamble. But it's uh, like anything, it, you know, there's a certain amount of investment you have to make and you hope that you get it back. Uh, what, are, what are the pleasures? What, what are the things that's, what's the thing that's making you get up every morning? and, you know, come here and look out on the vineyard and look out on the lake. What are the things that are... What drives you? Yeah. What, what makes you... Well, you have to have a general interest in it to start with. If you're not interested in plants, uh, you're not interested in uh, winemaking, if you're not interested in meeting people and talking to people, uh, then I would not recommend this type of business. Uh, but it's uh, it's a varied... Uh, there's different aspects of it. It's something different all the time. Uh, and 
If you have a passion for it and you're interested in it, you don't have to want to get up in the morning. You're already up and ready to go. If you don't like what you're doing and you dread it every day, then somebody has to wake you up. But nobody wakes me up. I'm up at 4.35 o'clock and I'm here till 6 or 7 o'clock and I'm open seven days a week. Uh, and I, I can't remember the last day I had a day off. So that's about as much of a passion as you can get. I don't know how you could get any more passionate about what you do, but I enjoy it. I enjoy people. I enjoy sitting here talking to you. I enjoy explaining these things to you. These are little challenges and accomplishments that I've did over the years, and I'm relating it to you and, and so that you understand. And uh, that makes me feel good that you understand how this is all put together and how the wine's made. And, uh, and I take people on basement tours, and I, I do the same thing with the public when they come in, whether it's two people or 20, I take them through the basement, explain it to them. And uh, a lot of them are not familiar with winemaking. They're not familiar, they, them big tanks down there overwhelm them. You know, they just can't imagine a stainless steel tank that big. Uh, they don't understand uh, how the presses and the corkers and the frame filters. It's all new to them, and I enjoy that. I enjoy explaining something to somebody that's, that doesn't know anything, that, that you're starting from scratch and explaining it to them. Uh, so that's kind of a fun thing to do, too. What, what is, what's the future for the winery and, and the vineyard here? What do you see in the future? Well, just try to make as best wines as I can and try to be as successful with it as I can. And try to keep my health. I'm almost 65, so I've just got a few years left. Maybe that's the reason I work seven days a week because I don't have long to go. Uh, but just try to make it successful as I can and uh, see what develops. Uh, I don't have any grand plan about 50,000 cases a year and expanding this and expanding that. I'm done. My years of expanding, this is it. Now it's just going to be to to make this profitable and, and uh, develop what I have. Uh, there's no expanding or getting bigger. Uh, this is it. This, this, whoever expands it or makes it bigger will take my place, <laughs> be my replacement, not me. Uh, this is about all that I can handle. Um, and finally, I, I ask everybody the same question. I'll ask you this question. And that's the fact that this is an oral history interview. And, you know, maybe one day your grandkids or your great-grandkids or some, one of them could walk into the Illinois State Museum. And this, this interview is going to be archived forever. And mm -hmm. I wanted to give you the opportunity to leave something in this interview for them. Leave something in this interview that would be memorable to them? Well, for them. Anything for that you them. want them to know? Or... Well, the only thing I can tell them is... Uh, Work hard, uh, uh, do the best you can, uh, uh, enjoy life, uh, and uh, just try to do the best you can to be successful. And uh, uh, that's about all I can. Uh, that's about all I can come up with. Is just that's great. is. Uh, well, great. Thank you very much, Ed.